Yeah, it's your boy Chillier. Welcome back to Hardware 3D. Today, I've got a little bit of a smorgasbord. Uh, word, word wrong. Uh, schmer, schmergasburb. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna leave that in there. So we got a bunch of topics today. The main one is going to be a little bit of uh, shading accuracy issue. Uh, Renormalization. So a little bit of theory and best practices. We'll, we'll call that the main topic for this video, although this video has many topics. So you guys know the deal, but just for a little bit of a recap, you know, we've got geometry, it's made up of triangles, uh, but we want to render it as smooth geometry, like this blue curve here. Now triangles aren't smooth, so what you do is you, you, you give each of the vertices of your geometry some normals, and those are used to calculate your, you do, do your lighting calculations, right? So you do the dot product between the light vector, uh, maybe pointing this way, and the uh, the normal, and that gives you how much that surface is pointing towards the light, and that tells you how bright the surface is. You shade with that, and things that aren't smooth look smooth, and that's great. Uh, and the way you get that smoothness is by interpolating between these normals of the vertices. So here we've got a normal, here we've got a normal, this is stored in our geometry. This, we're rendering across the face of this geometry here, so we interpolate between these two normals to find the normal at this point. And we can see that the direction, if we use linear interpolation, the direction is in between these two directions here, which is what you want. Gives you a nice smooth gradation of normals, gives you a nice smooth gradation of shading. So far so good, I hope. Uh, now, thing about normals is their length is equal to 1.0. And that's important because when you do things like, let's say you've got uh, a normalized vector that's pointing towards your light, you do the dot product and that will give you basically the cosine of the angle between them. It'll tell you how much they're pointing in the same direction. Uh, if this was not a normal, you would have a scaling. So it would make your, your light brighter or darker. So it's important to work with normals that have a unit length of one. Now. You might think, well, if we're linear, linear interpolating between this normal, which has a length of 1, and this normal, which has a length of 1, the result will also have a length of 1. That's not true. That can be easily disproven. I mean, just, what is linear interpolation, right? It's just, you draw a line between the points of these vectors, and you're going to see that your linear interpolated vector is only going to be this long. It's going to be shorter than... One. So that means that your light is going to be a little dimmer. Your calculated light at this point on your geometry is going to be a little dimmer than it should be after your interpolation. So that means anytime you interpolate two normals, you really want to renormalize it to recover the length. Now, if you have fairly dense geometry, um, you don't have you know too many super sharp edges. Most of your normals are going to be pointing in roughly the same direction, like most of your adjacent normals, I mean. And that means that uh, when you interpolate between them, you're not going to lose that much length. The, the amount of length you lose uh, is proportional to the angle between the vectors. So if the vectors are both pointing in the same direction, you linear interpolate, the resulting vector is also going to be a length of 1. If the vectors are pointing in wildly different directions and you linear interpolate, you're going to get a much shorter vector. Uh, so usually, not renormalizing uh, doesn't cause you big problems. And you can see that because we haven't been renormalizing much, if at all, in the current engine, and it hasn't looked super dumb. So renormalization, sometimes it's a very small difference, sometimes it can be a very big difference. Um, what else? Well, okay, there's another issue here. So if we have two vectors of unit length, and we linear interpolate between them halfway, you're going to get a vector whose direction is halfway. It's shorter, but its direction will be halfway. But that's not true if your starting uh, normals that you're interpolating between don't have the same length. So take these two vectors here, and let's say we're going to linear interpolate halfway between them. The halfway point is here. So this is the linear interpolated vector between these two. This one is, let's say, length of 1. This one is length of, you know, greater than 1. Uh, so, now this linear interpolated vector, it's not pointing. We've interpolated halfway between linearly, but the angle is not halfway. We can see that this angle is much larger than this angle here. Uh, so, linear interpolation will give you 
a uh, angle that is halfway between the two only if their lengths, their starting lengths of these two vectors were the same. So if your lengths aren't the same for your starting vectors that you're interpolating between, you're not going to get the correct angle. You're going to get both uh, a vector which is not li uh, unit length and is not pointing in the right direction, and that's bad. So that means that not only should you normalize after interpolation, but you should also make sure that your vectors before interpolation have been normalized. And you can see that if you do a linear interpolation and you get a vector that's not unit length, and then you do another interpolation with a normal between that one that has bad length, you're going to get a vector which not only has more bad length, but which is also pointing in the wrong direction. So you can see these errors, they compound together the more interpolations you do without unit length normals. And that's basically the concept that I just wanted to, you know, make you guys aware of today is that renormalization. Now let's look at the code and let's see how we can fix what we've got. So in my first commit here, um, I just did some renaming and fixing up of comments in the shaders. It's not a big deal, but you can see, for example, I mentioned this in a previous video, but instead of calling this normal n, I call it view normal because it's the normal after we've, you know, rotated it into view position. Then after that, we do the renormalization. So let's look at this. So all we're doing here in the uh, the Fong pixel shader is after we get in our view normal that has been interpolated between two normals on the geometry, um, we're normalizing that before we do any work on it. And that's it. And that will make our shader a little more correct. And it's the same idea when we're doing uh, normal mapping. Here, instead of taking in, you're using directly the view normal from the geometry, uh, we actually do a lookup into the normal map and then we rotate that by the TBN matrix and after we've rotated it we're gonna normalize it now why do we normalize this is it because the rotation changed the length no and you might be saying well chili uh, we sample this normal from our normal map uh, our normal map is normals that we have created so they should all be unit length and we shouldn't have to renormalize but that's incorrect for two reasons reason number one is sampling when you're doing uh, linear filtering you're actually uh, linear interpolating between adjacent samples between four adjacent samples so you are doing a lerp and that means that you do have to renormalize the second reason why that's wrong is because if you look online and you look at a lot of normal maps you'll find they're not quite all unit length so mainly for those two reasons you want to normalize those normals that you've sampled out of the normal map. Now, let's look at a little bit of how we can organize our shaders a little better, a little make them a little more dry. Don't repeat yourself. Uh, so one thing I did here was I pulled out some operations out of the shader. So here I'm pulling normal mapping out of the main shader. It's probably easier if I look at this in uh, file view. Here you can see I've created a separate function uh, map normal view space and then I just call that in here if normal map is enabled and that makes the code a little more readable a little better organization there but it's also going to enable us later on to reuse this function in you know various shaders without copy and pasting you'll see that in a second but the next thing I do is a little bit more just renaming uh, so the light position is actually the light the position of light in view space if you remember so I renamed that just to make it a little less deceptive is the correct word, I believe. So anyways, renaming. And then I'm going to pull out some other common procedures from our main shader here. Uh, so I pull out... What do I pull out? Do lots of lots of pulling out today. Uh, speculate. I call it speculate. It's just doing the specular shading calculations there. And I do diffuse, which is you know, doing that diffuse calculation, the Lambertian, if you will. And attenuate does the attenuation calculation, which is, you know, our, our old inverse square buddy in there. I also did a little bit of renaming in here for map normal. Now you can see here, I've added some uh, specifiers to these functions, the, the parameters here. Like for example, const in. So I'm making these parameters, I'm saying they're const, can't change it within, within the function, um, just, just because it's not super important. And I'm also saying that these are input parameters only. Um, you don't have to add these things. It's probably not a huge deal. 
but I like to add them in just to, to lock things down a little bit more. Similarly, Uniform is stating that this diffuse color parameter won't change between uh, invocations of this function in the same draw call. So the uh, diffuse color will always be the same within the same draw call. And this diffuse color, by the way, is coming from our light, our diffuse color here. So of course the light isn't going to change, you know, between different pixels on the same piece of, uh, on the same mesh that we're rendering. So those, that's uniform. The intensity of the diffuse light is uniform, so I can mark them like that. And, you know, once we've pulled all of these um, functions out, the body of the shader becomes a lot leaner. We've removed a lot of stuff from there. And Bob's your uncle. Again, I do a little bit of, you know, minor variable renaming, renaming things to view what I do. Ah, the tangent and the bitangent, they're also in view space, so I rename them to view tan and view bitan. You get the idea. One last thing I do is I pull the normalization of the TBN. Uh, I pull that out of the, our, uh, our map normal function. So if you have already pre-normalized tan, by tan, and normal, uh, you can pass them in and they won't get normalized again for no reason. And then I do some shader includes. So just like C and C++ files, um, you can include HLSL files or any text file into another HLSL file. Is I create a file called shader ops and this contains our map normal function, our attenuate, our diffuse, and our speculate functions. And then I also create an include that's point light that uh, does the definition of a point light constant buffer. And now in Fong pixel shader specular normal, um, I replace cbuff here, the definition with the point light .hlsl, and I replace all this stuff here with include shader ops. So the file has now become much, much shorter because all the code is being included from in here. And now when I want to change the way I do my diffuse or the way I calculate my specular, I can change it in my shader ops file. And all the files that include that will automatically get that change. They'll have me having to go through each file and do the same change in each one. And you can see to begin with, I've only uh, refactored our main shader here specular normal map to use the includes, but later on I will make the other shaders also use those includes. So that's the main thing that I wanted to show you guys about, you know, organizing shaders a little bit better. There's much more that you can do, but that's one baby step in the way of making better shaders. Uh, now let's move on to fixing something that has been annoying me for a long time. Hard coding of that freaking shader path. So if I can find it in here, so this is what we've been doing up until now. We've had this um, string called base, and we are using that as the, uh, the base path in which to look for textures. Now, what I want to do is like, for example, if I load something that's in models, gobber, and you know, let's say goblin.obj, then I want it to look for textures in models gobber. I want it to strip off the, uh, the file name and use the rest of that path to search for where the textures are. So in order to do that, we're going to include file system. And I rename this from file name to path string because that's actually better. It's not just the name of the file, it's the, the whole relative path to the, uh, the model file. And so just a little bit of renaming there. And we're going to pass that entire path to parse mesh. And what it's going to do is it's actually going to take that in not as a string, but as a uh, std file system path. And you can do that, it'll automatically convert for you. And what that gives us is that gives us the ability to get the parent path, which is basically everything um, up until the final slash and the file name. So with the parent path, we add some slashes onto the end, and that is now our root path in which we can look for textures. And so now we don't need this anymore. Except for the mesh tag here, I want the full path to the, uh, the model file as the beginning part of the mesh tag. So I just use path.string path there. But yeah, now when we load different models in different places, it won't screw up. And then what I did was I did a little test, load all of our models now that we have in the same scene. So we got our wall, we got our uh, test plane, we've got our nano suit, and we've got the goblin all together 
Forever in Love. Uh, and then I did a little bit of rearranging, you know, just their their relative sizes and their positions and stuff like that. What did I do in mesh here? Ah, I added the ability to pass in when you're constructing a model a scale, so it'll scale it up or down, and that's just convenient. It lets me do stuff like this, so I can scale up the goblin and the wall, and the nano a little bit, because I believe, yeah, here I was actually hard coding a scale. That's not good when you're loading a bunch of different models. It's not going to be a good time. Now, the first thing you might notice when you load this up for the first time is, you know, it kind of takes for freaking ever to load, and that's because our current loading code is crap, and we will replace it sometime in the future. Uh, but besides that, yeah, it looks good. All our stuff is loaded. Uh, normal, let me see if I can move this light here. Normal mapping seems to be working. Let me just bring this back a little bit. And so, yeah, normal mapping is working on our bricks there and on our goblin. Uh, now, one thing, normal mapping on our uh, nano suit, the normals, the surface normals, they look kind of crap. Look at, look at this here. This one is all lit up. This one's not lit up. And then if I move the X, then this side, it's, it's dumb and it's bad. And the reason why it is dumb and bad is because, I mentioned this before, but the normal maps for this model actually suck butts. They're not good, they're just weird and bad. So, a little bit later down the commits, I actually delete all the normal maps and edit the nanosuit material file to not use normal maps. But, that's a little bit later. The next thing we do, refactoring object space normal map. So, uh, now I start the, the little bit of a job here of refactoring other shaders to let them use our includes. So the object space normal map, yeah, we're gonna include a bunch of stuff, we're gonna replace a bunch of stuff, it's gonna be shorter, it's gonna be nicer. Note that we can't actually uh, call our normal mapping function here because it's this object space normal mapping is different than the normal mapping we're doing in our function. So we don't call that one, but we do call attenuate and diffuse and speculate. Now when we do that little bit of refactoring for our uh, object space normal mapping shader, what we're going to see is it causes a bit of a problem. So we can see this is on our object space normal mapped boy here. And we're getting specular, but we're not getting diffuse. But if we go on the other side of him, yeah, here's, a, here's our diffuse. So the normal vector pointing in the wrong direction. So if you look at the object map, and what we were doing before is we were flipping the Y because we were converting from OpenGL to uh, Direct3D. And we were flipping the Z because we were converting from a tangent space normal map into an object space normal map. And our object, its default position, Z should be pointing negative. Um, so the new way we do it is we just do uniform mapping for all these different things. So I don't want, I don't want to hard code in my shader a fix up because my, uh, because my asset doesn't match my model. I want to make my asset match my model and then I only have one shader that works with all my assets. So I want to fix my normal map. I want to make a copy of the wall normal map where the Z's are pointing negative and the Y's are pointing in the, in the correct direction for direct 3D. So what I do here is I do some, I do some very dumb bullshit, but it was kind of fun. So um, I create a little header file here called normal map twerker. And it's just a collection. It's a class. It doesn't need to be a class because it's all static functions. Uh, it's a collection of functions that work on an image file and process every pixel in the image file but processes them as ver vectors. So we have a couple of functions here. Color to vector, which takes in a color and converts it to XM vector. And vector to color, which does the opposite. And then in rotate axis one, X axis 180, I'm rotating all the vectors 180 degrees around the X axis. Because if you think about it, that does the two things that we want in the dumbest way I can think of. Uh, the two things we want is we want to flip the Y and we want to flip the Z. And if you rotate 180 degrees around the x-axis, the Z and the Y will be pointing in the opposite direction. So imagine here's our, we're looking down our x-axis, here's Z-axis and Y-axis, maybe they're flipped, I can't remember, but it doesn't matter. Uh, if we rotate 180 degrees around the, the x-axis, 
uh, the new point is going to be negative of the old y and negative of the old z. All right, so it doesn't matter. What matters is that uh, we now have a function. We can give it a path for an input uh, image and an output image. It will load that image, it will run some processing on it, and it will save it out again. And I use that to create a brick while normal OBJ, which is our brick while normal map, but into the object space that we want. And we can we need we see that because now the Z, which is the blue, is negative. So because there is um, very low blue instead of very high blue, it becomes a yellow texture. And the way I created this, the way I actually invoked this function to do work, this is the dumb part, by the way. This is the very dumb part. Well, the rotation was a dumb part. This is another dumb part. Uh, so first thing I did was I added uh, the ability to pass the command line into our app and then app stores the command line and you know gives you access to it within app and within this constructor. And what I did, well first I wanted to use the parse the command line and check for a certain switch that would indicate that I should process an image. The only problem with this is that the command line is just a single string, it doesn't come in parsed. And I couldn't, there's no real good function in Windows to parse a string into a command line, a set of command line arguments. So after a little bit of digging, I found that there's a function called command line to argvw. So you can't parse a narrow string command line into a list of arguments, but you can parse a wide one. So now I get the wide command line, and then I parse the wide command line, and then I convert that to narrow using the ghetto conversion when I want to invoke my normal map twerker function. And I do this all in the constructor here, which is, you know, ugly and dumb, but it works. And later on, I will clean it up a little bit more. I mean, really, in real life, you wouldn't put this code into your game engine. You would have a separate, you know, command line utility that handles this stuff. But I didn't want to cram another separate solution into this uh, repo. And I didn't want to have two separate repos now that people had to go to to see the code. So I put it all in here just to make the tutorials easier. Not because I think it is a particularly good idea from a software organization standpoint. Got it? Good. And when we run it, it looks wrong. This one looks darker than this one. If we put the Z in, yeah. What the heck? Now we go back to the test plane, we verify, yes, we are loading the correct file. And we already know that this file is the correct normal map because we looked at it and it was yellow as expected. Uh, and we also know that we have the, the correct transform C buff here. We have the correct shader. Uh, pixel shader, so it should work and yet it isn't and so something about our assumptions is wrong So we need to go back So as usual, let's take this opportunity to show off some of the things you can do with the graphics debugger First thing we can do is we can look at the different textures and uh, we can see okay Is it actually loading what we expect it to load? So I mean if I click on some different ones here, you can see eh, I've got this one's from the goblin as you saw down there I've got one, this is from the brick wall. So these four are probably all from the brick wall because they have the same size. Uh, so here we have brick wall, diffuse, here's the normal. This is in the uh, tangent space. And then here we have diffuse and normal in object space. So we see, okay, the object space normal map is being loaded. The stuff that we expected, the, the processing that we did, that file is being loaded onto the GPU side. It exists over there, so that much is true. The next place you want to look is probably going to be the pixel shader. We can step into the pixel shader, we can see, you know, how the normals are being sampled, how they're being processed. Is there a problem with our pixel shader somewhere? Or is there a problem with one of the inputs? So we can look at the triangle, we can run the pixel shader, and then we can step through our code here. We can mouse over different variables, see what they are. But before we even start stepping through, there's one thing that we can check, the, uh, the texture 2D and the normal map. We can mouse over that and we can actually inspect what that is, what this pixel shader invocation is using for its textures and normal maps. And if we do that, we see, wait a minute, it's not using the yellow one. So we know that the yellow one's being loaded, but it's not being used by the model that should be using it. 
One final little trick I want to show you guys here. If we select uh, this draw indexed call here, after selecting a pixel, it's going to show us up here object 5 here, which is the context that was used for that draw index call. We click on the context and it's very interesting. It can show us the state of the context as set um, at this point here. And we can look down here, we can look at the pixel shader and we can see shader resources. So we can see the shader resources, basically textures that have been bound to slot 0, slot 1, and slot 2. So slot 1 has texture 41, slot 2 has texture 29. Texture 41 here is our yellow, texture 29 is our blue. So we've got a lot of clues here. We know that our pixel shader is using this one, and we know that we're binding both the object space and the tangent space ones, but our texture is using the one bound to slot 2. After this, it's just a matter of a little bit of verification. We check our shader, and we see, yeah, the, uh, the normal map is supposed to be bound to slot 2. And we look back on our test plane, and we had been bounding, binding it to slot 1, and therein lies the problem. You might be wondering, well, why didn't we see this problem before? And the answer was because before we were using the same texture for both of them. So the texture that was being bound to slot 2 from the other wall was just being carried over to when we draw the one from the test plane. But once we changed the textures, then we had a bug that was pre-existing and had become revealed due to a recent change. And we see here, now everything is working as intended. Now after that, like I said, I lose all of the normal maps for the Nano Boy. And because I have now a new configuration where I only have specular and no normal map, I've got to add a shader for that. So I had Fong Pixel Shader Specular. Nice and, nice and short here, using our shader ops. And I add the case where we have a diffuse map, but we don't have a normal map, but we have a specular map. That's this case right here. Now we can see the Nano Boy is looking sexy as ever. Let's, let's rotate him. Let's let him spin. Show us your stuff. Blah! Oh, what is this? So, this is a problem with our current uh, node system. The ability to manipulate the node transforms. When we select it for the first time, it is going to reset the position. Basically, we set this position in the constructor, but the code, this code here for the window, is not uh, aware of that, and so it writes over it with its own data as soon as we select the node. But let's just enjoy Shiny Nano Boy for a little while. Isn't he, sh isn't he a sexy boy? Okay, good. So, before I fix that issue with the, uh, with the node transforms, I just uh, basically go over now all of my other shaders and refactor them to use our new he shader headers here. So they get smaller, they get drier, they get sexier. So now let's look at that uh, node system that I was creating there. So, uh, like I said, we can set, or what we're doing is in the constructor, we're setting positions and orientations of our models, but we need a way of our imGUI system to read that information before it does its own setting of transformations. So, first thing I do is I create a little header called Chili XM. That's like uh, extra functions for the DirectX math stuff. And I want two things. I want a function that can take a transformation matrix and extract some set of Euler angles that can give the rotation part of that transformation. So get the Euler angles for a transformation and get the translation part of it out of a transformation. And that's just a bunch of math stuff. You can Google it online. That's basically what I did. I Googled it, I massaged it, and I got this. Then I make our node manipulation system read the initial node transforms before it starts to do its own bullshit. So for a mesh, I add a function to be able to get the transform, the applied transform of that mesh. And that's basically as simple as you would expect. And then down here, instead of merely resolving a transform out of the map, uh, because if it doesn't exist in the map for uh, the current node, it's going to create an empty one. But we don't want that. What we want to do is search for the transform. If the transform doesn't exist, then we want to load it from what's already in that node, what's in that applied transform. So we get the applied transform, we extract the angles in the translation, and then we build up transform parameters 
and we insert that into our map. Or if it already exists in the map, then we just use it like that. This is a little neat trick from the standard library. Um, insert only inserts if it has if it doesn't already exist. So it returns a pair iterator to the thing that was inserted if anything was inserted, and then a boolean saying whether or not something was inserted. And what std tie here is doing is it is basically allowing me to instead of take that return value as a pair, I can write the return of the pair directly into i and I can ignore the second one. A little bit of destructuring here. But anyways, that's not important. What is important is now it is taking in consideration the initial transform on the thing when you click on it for the first time in the im GUI interface. So now if I click on my nanosuit, it doesn't jump immediately to the origin, it stays where it is with the transform that I gave it from the constructor and I can rotate him and he's still sexy as F and I love it. And the last thing is a little bit of a fix up in Chili Math. This algorithm here to wrap the angle to within a certain range, it wasn't doing the job correctly and um, somebody on the Discord, Falshill, pointed it out, so big ups to him and I fixed it. One last little minor tweak I did here in post was I sexied up the goblin model because uh, it was bothering me. It didn't look as cool as he could look. So what I did was, uh, you can see here, I made him more green. I changed the ratio of blending between the subsurface texture and the surface texture. And I like it better like this, more goblin-like. I also toned down the specular weight and I uh, toned down the ambient lighting. And so that gives us a little better balance in the colors here. Specular isn't overwhelming now so that we could turn down the ambient and get us a little more dynamicism on the lighting. And I think it looks, I think it looks a lot better this way, actually. Goblin boy, looking much sexier, in my opinion. Not a big deal, just something that was kind of bothering me ever since I released the, uh, the last video. But there you go. That is all the stuff. That is the smorgasbord of uh, stuff that I wanted to go over in this video. Again, Number one takeaway from this video is renormalization. It is a small thing, but it's something that you should do. We've started a little bit on the path of writing better shaders, better naming for our variables, and uh, less code duplications, and we are going to be continuing on with that as we progress, using more and more better techniques for organizing our shader code. We fixed the hard coding in the texture path, the material loading code, um, there's still way more to do with that. We still want to pull out the material stuff and put it in its own function or ideally its own class. A bit of organization of that stuff. We don't want that huge switch of different uh, combinations of maps and stuff like that. We want to make that a lot better. So that'll be in a future video. We're going to really look at that system and make it a lot cleaner and sexier. And our normal map corker, our little command line utility thing that we built into our game engine. That's a dumb thing, but uh, we'll probably see it evolve a little bit as needed when we want to process some textures. Uh, it can be easier to do that processing sometimes in code rather than trying to figure it out using, you know, something like Photoshop. If you know, if you already know the mathematical operations you want to perform on the different channels, it's way easier to just type them out and run it through your own batch that you create in C++. In the next video, I got something a little exciting for you guys. We're going to be loading a whole scene, a whole building or piece of architecture that we can move around in. A very famous test scene called Sponza. It's going to be our most interesting, most sexy looking scene up, in, up to date. And it is going to provide a good motivation for learning some future topics. Specifically, MIP mapping and alpha blending. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more hardware 3D.